Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody uh, from around the world. I'm your host with uh, Professor Sally Benson for today's uh, Stanford Global Energy Dialogue. Our dialogue today is on the topic of energy resilience against extreme weather. There has been significantly increased frequency of extreme weather events globally in the past two decades. In February of this year, we all know the state of Texas experienced unprecedented extreme cold weather. The energy infrastructure could not handle such extreme cold, causing cat catastrophic situation of, for the people of Texas. In California, extreme heat waves and massive wildfire that lead to rotating power outages leaving thousands without power of extended periods of time. Uh, and this become the norms of lives. Power safety shutoff have become commonplace as a means to reduce risk from the heat, wildfires, and wind. Energy resilience against extreme weather is an important topic for us to discuss today. As the world works to extract extreme climate issues. The world energy infrastructure is expected to undergo rapid transformation over the coming three decades. So today, we are fortunate to have two people with deep expertise building up the national energy infrastructure. They understand the issue of energy resilience well. Both are proudly a Stanford alumni both serve as advisory council members to the uh, Stanford Prico Institute for Energy. Uh, they are my, uh, both, uh, both of them are my good friends. Uh, Mike Morgan is co-founding partner of Triangle Peak Partners, a venture capital and growth equity firm focused on energy and technology. He is the lead director of Kingdom Morgan, one of the largest energy infrastructure companies in North America. Our other guest today, Dow Kimmerman, established Energy Capital Partners, the largest independent owner in the United States of electricity generation, renewable power and energy storage assets. In April 2005, uh, Dow served as its senior partners. And prior to founding Energy Capital Partners, he spent 22 years with Goldman Sachs in the firm's uh, pipeline and utility department within the investment banking division. And I also like to mention both Mike and Doug, they serve in the board of Sanova, a residential solar company. So before we start our conversation, let us have a couple of quizzes to warm up everybody. Um, quiz number one. In 2020, how many major notable natural disaster events took place in the United States? So the answer to this question is uh, D. There were nine events in uh, 2020. So our audience is doing pretty well, 35% uh, got it right, that's the highest. Uh, looking at the historical data, the frequency of extreme weather events has increased dramatically over the past two decades. According to Wiki, under the list of natural disasters in the United States, there were nine major notable disasters events in 2020. Of this, seven were hurricanes, two were wildfires, in total causing the death of more than 400 people, loss of about $100 billion. Let's do the quiz number two. How much damage in US dollars did the February 2021 winter storm in Texas cost? So the answer is about 200 billion. Uh, as much of uh, March 25, the cold spell in Texas told one, 111 deaths and over close to 200 billion in losses. 
for calibration purposes, 2019 GDP in Texas is $1.9 trillion. So Texas lost about 10% of uh, GDP during this one winter storm. We will now turn things over to Sally to start our dialogue with Doc and Mike. Um, Sally. Okay, thank you very much. Um, welcome, Mike and Doug. Um, thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to a really lively conversation today. And over the course of our discussion, we'll talk about infrastructure, investment, policy, and innovation. But let's start with what went wrong in Texas and what could have been done better. So to kick off this, uh, Doug, you know, can you tell us what happened, you know, help paint a picture of what, what, what went wrong during this period of extreme cold? Sure, a lot went wrong. So it'll take a little, little time to go through that, but maybe let's just start with maybe uh, unlike in past decades, this time around, we were really putting reliability uh, in the hands of an intermittent resource that mostly being wind uh, in the case of, of, of Texas. And so the redundancy this time around needed to ensure 100% uh, reliability all of the time, uh, especially in this case you know, of a large intermittent and, and not a, a, a baseload resource is generally something that market designers and, and regulators, uh, they've not been willing to expose uh, customers to. Uh, maybe stated differently, honestly, they'd rather see customers have lower or moderate prices 99% of the time than to design and, and pass on the cost of, of withstanding perhaps this once in a, in a decade uh, event. So the obvious in Texas, it gets very hot in the summer, and that's generally what Texas is designed to, to protect against. So a, a prolonged uh, zero degree winter event uh, it's rare, uh, but it's not unprecedented. If we, you go back in time, Mike and I like to say we're not weathermen, but I, we do go, go back and look at the data. It's been cold before, mm -hmm. minus 23, I think is the record, happened in 1899 and 1933. The greatest snow event was 1923, worse, worse than this one. And, and this year's cold maybe was the third or fourth uh, coldest ever. So not unprecedented. Um, and, and when you're designing power plants, a lot of people are saying, well, winterize, we got to design it differently. Um, you design them differently, whether you're worried about a, a summer peak uh, or a, a winter peak. Texas, generally, the, the um, uh, reliability issues are in the summer. And if you were going to build a power plant uh, in Texas to withstand a winter extreme event, i.e. maybe putting it inside and putting walls around it, think how expensive that would be to cool it and ventilate it with air conditioning uh, in the summer. So they really weren't built for good reason uh, for, for this type of event. But this time really it was the longevity uh, of the cold. Now, interestingly, uh, yesterday, shockingly, and maybe I'm, I'm glad in anticipation of our talk here, power prices shot up to about $2,000 uh, a megawatt hour. That's about a hundred fold uh, increase. And it really wasn't an extreme weather event. There was a cold front uh, that, that came through, but at a time when power plants, the thermal power plants, many of them are out for scheduled maintenance in preparation for the summer months when society needs them to run practically every hour for, for 90 days straight. And uh, you can't do that without getting mechanically uh, prepared. So we had a lot of plants down uh, and we had a little bit of a, of a cold snap, uh, but didn't have the wind and didn't have the solar available. The conditions weren't, weren't that, that good yesterday. So demand shot up uh, in the cold, uh, supply uh, wasn't there because the quick start thermal capacity was, was offline and um, causes the, the price to spike up. So um, this is going to be recurring uh, when you're relying on uh, heavily, a, a big part of the marketplace being an intermittent uh, renewable uh, resource. Unfortunately, electricity, uh, the nature of the commodity, it, it doesn't have the capability to allow for large scale storage. We're going to talk about that day, the, today to, to, to ways and new technologies to deal with storage, but that's really what, what we need. So very quickly, your question was, was what happened? I can come up with maybe something like 10 different things, but, but top of the list was wind, 20,000 megawatts of capacity, and at the peak of the storm, maybe 19,500 of it not uh, uh, functioning. Um, and so that was big problem number one. Uh, extreme demand for electricity given this prolonged cold weather, well beyond system uh, planning forecasts. Uh, so demand beyond available supply, uh, another big one. ERCOT uh, anticipated that there was gonna be a system crisis of demand exceeding supply and they didn't want the whole system to crash. Uh, so they ordered uh, uh, shut-in outages and shut-in of plants. Uh, some might say that was a little bit of a, of a mistake because many of these plants that were taken offline, it just took them a long time to come back. We did have schedule outages at this time of year. 
uh, in anticipation of the summer. So uh, we, we had some power offline. Uh, because we had no electricity, no gas, we can't run gas compressors to, to get the gas to the power plants. Uh, that was a problem. Uh, some of the gas system, and I'm sure Mike will talk about this, froze and gas couldn't be delivered uh, in the quantity needed. So no gas, no power, because gas is, is the dominant uh, source of power generation uh, in, in Texas. Uh, the freezing impacted uh, some of the gas and coal plants, not nearly as much as, as what we lost from the wind being out and from the impact of some of the forced outages. But some of the thermal plants, you know, um, were hit by the weather. They came back relatively quickly over a two to three day period. Uh, the demand for gas shot up, as I mentioned, certainly for home heating. So there was less gas available for, for power generation. We lost about a thousand megawatts of, of nuclear. There's a lot of stuff here, isn't it? Uh, lost a thousand megawatts of nuclear uh, for a few days. Some of the, the uh, feed water um, uh, froze and forced an outage. And then maybe lastly, it's just the, the reaction to prices. Power prices shot up from say $20 to a $9,000 megawatt hour cap. Gas shot up from $2 to 200. And some suppliers found it just too expensive uh, to buy to meet obligations. And some customers just shut off because they couldn't couldn't afford to pay for it. So a lot there, Sally. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, I guess I should have asked you what went right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, then that, that would have been brief. <laughs> that would have been a shorter list. But uh, yeah, no, obviously a lot of things. So, so, so Mike, uh, Doug mentioned that, you know, that you, you all had been looking at the weather and, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, you heard some statistics from Doug, but I went back and looked in the last 40 years, you know, which is sort of recent history. And in uh, there were 1983, 1989, uh, 2011, you know, had similarly cold temperatures. Yeah. Um, so you'd think that, that Texas would be prepared for it. So why wasn't Texas prepared for this? Yeah, I mean, uh, Doug, Doug get a lot of this, but it, it really, you know, Texas is hardened for heat and hurricanes. I mean, that is most of the thinking and most of the design planning is really focused on those two things. I think one thing, we certainly it's gotten cold before. One unique part about this, if you compare it to the storm in 2011, to 10 years earlier, was the duration of the cold. And so I, I playing amateur weatherman, I grabbed a few statistics, but, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth was, was below freezing 40% longer. Houston was about 30% longer. And Austin you know, spent a week below freezing, which was about 130% more uh, than they've spent at those extremely low temperatures. So what you get is this kind of cascading effect. The longer you stay down there, the worse it gets. The other thing, and Doug hit this, but just to put a little bit of uh, numbers around it, and I couldn't get all the way to 2020, but, but uh, from 2011 to 2018, you know, and this is in trillions of BTUs, but wind went from 300 to 690, so more than doubled, that's up about 390. Gas went up also about 190, and then all at the expense of coal, which went down about 520, and uh, nuclear was pretty flat, uh, really hasn't been much change there. So what you had was an unprecedented duration of a cold event with the different mix that Doug was really talking about. And, and I will say one short answer of why Texas wasn't ready is they didn't practice. I mean, one of the simple policy fixes is to do drills and do simulations and try to go through some of this. So I think that's an easy, that's an easy prescriptive element coming out of this. Um, you know, look, the, the, the unfortunate thing was everybody started blaming everybody else the moment this happened. And, you know, there are a few facts, right? Gas, natural gas fire generation went up 255% and wind fell about 32%. And you, know, you can get into a debate about, well, were you tripped off accidentally? Was it a freeze up? There's a lot of work to go on how that all works. From the natural gas side, we saw huge draws on natural gas storage, right? So you think about electricity storage, which Doug said is, you know, there's, not, there's not much of it right now, but on the gas storage side, you had the combination of heating load for you know, folks who wanted to keep their houses warm um, and massive power demand as things tripped off and it really took uh, resilient natural gas infra storage infrastructure to help help uh, bridge that gap. But that's uh, I'll stop there because we I know we got a lot to go go through here. So yeah, okay, all right, thank you, uh, E. Back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sally, um, Doc, and Mike. Uh, for both of you, given the existing energy infrastructure, how could Texas do better to avoid such a big damage and loss of so many lives? 
from infrastructure management, supply and demand management, personal energy use, behavior change, or maybe some other things you can add. So uh, what could tax taxes do better to avoid, avoid this damage? Yeah, I guess I'll, uh, you want me to start, Mike. I mean, I'll throw out throw out a few more on the on the on the power side, but certainly uh, building more more capacity, um, and and we need a, a pricing mechanism so that it's economic uh, for more capacity to be built. They're cutting it too close to the edge on uh, on reserve margins if these extreme weather events are going to be more uh, certainly more the norm, and certainly we're going to have more intermittent renewables part of part of the mix. Um, winterize. I'm sure we'll. We'll talk about that, but consumers are going to have to pay for that, um, and um, you know it'll it'll cost a lot. It's not going to be 100% effective all of the time, but I certainly can think of that. 20,000 megawatts of wind shouldn't shouldn't be freezing up. You know, a lot of wind developers, um, you know, highly leveraged situations. Uh, there's not a lot of of margin in there, and um, you know who's going to pay for that uh, uh, to do that? But I could see some regulatory mandates on the, on the winterization side. Battery storage is, is, is probably the most important thing on the, on the horizon to back up the intermittent renewables. That's probably the most important need. Um, we still need technological breakthroughs. We need prices to come down. We need efficiencies to come up. And I think there's a lot of promise out there on this side, which can really help turn the intermittent renewables more towards a, a baseload uh, capacity. Capacity markets themselves, uh, this is a construct that, that works in other parts of, of the country because you may have a plant that is only called upon for the extreme events, a plant that may only run 15 hours a year. Texas is what's called an energy market. You only get paid when you, when you produce and, and, and sell energy. So who the heck is gonna spend 250 million, $500 million to build a power plant we are only gonna get paid 15 hours of the year. That, that doesn't work. You don't you know, make enough of a, of a return on energy sales alone. So a capacity uh, payment or, or call it a standby payment is, is a payment you get to be available. Your plant can't be broken. You've got to show that it's available uh, and you get that standby payment, which then makes it economic for you to build that, that extra capacity. Again, it's gonna cause prices to go up uh, to have that and are consumers willing to pay more to ensure against the, the once every 10 year event, you know, possibly so. On the retail uh, side, you know, in, in Texas, you can choose your electricity uh, provider. Um, and perhaps some of those providers maybe uh, need to be required to have more financial staying power. Um, and if that's the case, that's gonna cost consumers as well. Um, and, and they were taking a lot of risk, trying to boost profitability. Maybe the most common practice, I call it playing the yield curve where they were buying power on a spot basis to supply a, a multi-year term contract uh, for a consumer. Um, and you earn a nice margin there and a nice spread when markets are normal, but you really get bit uh, when the prices spike. And that happened to a lot of them. So consumers benefited by lower prices until the extreme event hit. And you know some people are gonna have $50,000 power bills for a month uh, that they they can't pay them so no 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 free lunch great great prices 360 days a year and then really bad for five days so maybe we we shouldn't be allowing uh, such a risky uh, business model and the last one I don't know if we'll talk about is nuclear you know nuclear is green and nuclear is baseload a lot of the rest of the world is building nuclear the U S is still the world's largest producer of nuclear power at the peak had about 100 nuclear plants but I'd say we are shutting them down. Uh, probably at a pace of, of one every six months or so. They're very old. Um, California, you know, Diablo Canyon, the last one will be shut down soon, but maybe there needs to be a, a, a conversation uh, on nuclear. I put that on the list. Yeah, I, I would, that, that's, a, that's a great summary by Doug. I think, you know, think about how do you avoid the damage and loss? The, the thing I would add is one is you have to prioritize rolling outages uh, for many versus these extended outages for, you know, several million people. And they, the human cost of being, you know, without power, just it, it, it's almost an exponential increase the longer you go, especially when you've got below freezing temperatures everywhere. Um, the other thing you could do, like I said, you, you, could, you could simulate in practice, which clearly is part of it. But there are some very simple things that don't require, you know, bipartisan legislation or, or, or major changes. One of those, one of the things we saw is there were critical parts of natural gas infrastructure. So, you know, production, uh, gas processing and treating plants, uh, distribution facilities that weren't on the critical load list with the electric utilities. And so what you had was 
as the electric system began to curtail, they started curtailing, you know, some some things on the natural gas side that were absolutely critical to making sure the power kept flowing, right? So some very simple things that just, you know, take some, uh, require a fresh look. Um, the other thing I just talk about is, is if you can let more market signals get out there. Um, and, and Doug talked about energy versus the capacity market. You know, one example, Kinder Morgan operates um, uh, oil production in West Texas. And so when the price, they can see the price signal. When the price signal got to, you know, 9,000 a megawatt hour, um, Kinder Morgan was able to shut in production and redirect the power back to the grid because it was a very clear signal to be able to do that. You know, we see other markets like California uh, where there, there are little, you know, there are other things you can bid into for grid support. And so, in fact, the Rocky Mountain Institute has this great wheel of really 13 different services uh, that are really grid services, uh, um, you know, and, and things like frequency regulation and capacity and uh, black start capability. There, there are things other than energy that are really important to try to optimize. So I just sort of double click on what, uh, on what Doug said there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, back to Sally. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I wanna follow up on this uh, issue about the unregulated market. And if we look across the country, you know, it's very different in different places. In the Southeast, you have regulated utilities Texas, unregulated, California, maybe sort of a hybrid uh, of models. And, you know, of course, the, the idea of unregulated markets was is that the customers would have more choice, uh, they'd get lower prices, um, which is a big benefit. But we've, we've heard from both of you several times that um, that the prices really spiked and, and that the up to $9,000 a megawatt hour. Um, so you know, about 80 times sort of the typical value there. Um, and, and there was a direct fallout that customers uh, received very high bills. I saw, you know, I was looking in the newspapers, like people with $5,000 bills, you know, and that's a huge amount of money, um, you know, for, for most people. So, um, you know, the good news is, is that the system, you know, a lot of people still did have power, but, uh, you know, how do we, how do we move from where we are so that we can, you know, keep the benefits of an unregulated market, but at the same time, protect customers and have greater investments in uh, resilience that, that, that would make it so that we could ride through these better. Yeah. What's a, what's a strategy for sort of getting the best of both worlds? Well, I'll start, Sal, you're, you're right. There's different models all over the world. We deregulated the power markets in the United States. We followed the example of the UK uh, back in the in the late 90s and, and probably half the country uh, deregulated and half stayed under the regulated monopoly model. The, the theory was in a, in a utility, you know, roughly 50% of their assets are power generation. And that's the area where we thought competition would, could bring down prices. It didn't make sense in a monopoly model that a, an, a, an electric utility and the other businesses 35% of the, the assets are the regional distribution grid, 15% are the, the long line transmission. Um, and those are monopoly things. You're not going to have, you know, two transmission lines along the highway that compete with one another, but the utility shouldn't buy from them from themselves. And if they shop the market for power, as in any other industry, as in banking, as insurance, as in, uh, you know, airlines that were all deregulated, the consumer won. And so why would this industry be any different? Of course, the consumer should, should be better. And I think that's what we found, that the consumer, uh, the prices did go down, um, very much so, um, except, and I'll, and I'll get to um, what happened with, with bringing renewables into the picture. So unfortunately, California, uh, certainly as I look at, uh, at it, has the highest electricity prices now in the world, maybe rivaling uh, Germany neck, neck and neck. But for many uh, customers, you're paying over 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, maybe that's almost three times what you're paying in Texas, you know, for 360 days uh, days a year. And why is that? Uh, power prices should have gone down dramatically over the last 10 years because the major input to the price of electricity is the price of natural gas. That's the fuel on the margin that we most use in this country to make electricity. And the price of natural gas with the fracking phenomenon has dropped by something like 90%. From twelve or thirteen dollars to to two dollars, yet the price went up. And what else was going on at the time was was adding renewables to the mix. 
And so those that are saying, you know, the, the, the wind and sun are free and this is so cheap, they're missing out on a whole bunch of things, right? They're missing out of all the transmission lines that need to be uh, built uh, to connect the wind and solar, which is generally located in very remote uh, areas. They're missing out on all the backup thermal generation that has to be built to back up this highly, uh, you know, intermittent uh, resource. Um, and so when I go through all these pieces, I come back to just price discovery and, and maybe the, the uh, consumer hasn't been, you know, necessarily shown the, uh, uh, the, the real price here. Um, and, you know, in Texas, I think you and I talked about where 360 days, maybe they show a very low price that on average, maybe the price isn't that bad. Uh, but we have these five days that, you know, of, of, of extreme, and we need to fix these five days of extreme prices, right, through more storage, through more backup generation, but that's something that the consumer is going to need to pay for. And I think consumers at the end of the day don't want this volatility in prices. And I'd like to say in California, I don't really hear the outrage, you know, power prices are, are you know, just about the highest in the world. And I think Californians are realizing that there should be a price on carbon, and, and they're paying for that. And I think there's, there's more stability uh, in, that, uh, in that model. But those are some of my thoughts of uh, maybe the historical backdrop on how we got to where we are. Yeah, and I would just, just coming at it from the other angle, which is, uh, Doug did a good job of describing what I call utility scale solar and wind and some of the issues around that. And Doug and I, as, as he mentioned, are both on the board of Sonova, which is a residential solar company that's selling, you know, panels on your roof and, and uh, power walls, maybe Tesla power walls or other batteries in your garage and a gen set out back. And one of the other, you know, as customers get shocked with either just the absolute cost or the variability of cost or the unpredictability of it, we do see a lot of people choosing independence, right? Which is, well, I, I'm not gonna disconnect from the grid completely, but I'm gonna control more of my own destiny by generating, you know, get, getting rid of a lot of transmission and distribution costs by just putting the generation on my roof, having my own backup, whether it's a battery or a gen set or both. And, you know, as we've seen the cost of batteries come down dramatically, more of these kind of combined systems of distributed generation and storage are making sense. Now there's a long way to go there. Uh, but one of the things that, that once you start to construct those kinds of systems, you've got to have a software layer that's looking back at the grid and trying to understand when you should be charging your battery or discharging your battery, you know, how to optimize. And that's not something someone's going to sit in their home and do. So there's a, there's a big role for software over the next decade as, as we roll this out. And, you know, so some of the intermittency can be solved by policy and utility scale investments. Some of the customers are just going to take it into their own hands and solve the problem because they're not going to deal with the whiplash anymore. Yeah, and I just say I'm usually not a not a big fan of government subsidies, but you know, in the case of solar, in the case of batteries, uh, I think the the incentives and the tax incentives that made it cheaper for customers to to adopt uh, the the model of the distributed generation really are are helping reliability um, and helping prices go down. And I think it's it's the threat uh, to the utility model because I think it is um, a given that uh, battery technologies will improve, the price will, will come down, the reliability uh, will go up. Uh, and I think the government is, is kind of doing the right thing uh, to give their uh, a ramp to allow these, these, uh, these businesses to, 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 to come into play. But I do think distributed generation, and I'm glad Mike, you brought that up, um, that is gonna play an increasingly large, large role uh, as we all adopt that. If you drive around, you don't see too many homes with solar panels. Penetration is still in the in the low single digits, so we have a, a long way to go uh, in this country, which is uh, very promising. You know, the model of the home with the, the solar panel, the electric vehicle, uh, the the uh, battery charger. Um, we have the the smart meter that is going to be controlling uh, the usage in a more efficient way. How we're building homes, you know, more efficiently. A lot of exciting things in those areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, when we get to the end of this, I might come back and follow up on, on that question because, you know, I think there's also a concern that as more and more people sort of become more independent, you know, you still might have those days when you need the full capability of the grid and everybody, you know, even people who have generators and, and, and solar panels and batteries, they still may need it. 
uh, but how do you, you know, how do you pay for that when now you've got fewer and fewer people sort of contributing to a shared infrastructure? But we can get back to that question. Uh, so, E, you know, back back over to you. Yeah, thank you. So the discussion so far has been great and uh, setting up the understanding what went wrong and uh, what what were the problems. Um, well, I want to now take it from here and look into the uh, the future of infrastructure. Uh, the first question, Doc, for you, the Electricity Reliable Council of Texas, that's ERCOT, is the organization operating Texas electrical grid. Like I look at the ERCOT's report, the major resources, uh, the major sources of uh, electricity generation in Texas, natural gas about 50%, mm -hmm. wind about 25%, coal 13, there's 5% nuclear, very small solar uh, and, uh, and wind. Um, so if you look at all these, these sources of uh, electricity, uh, which of this uh, was most reliable during extreme cold weather? Uh, were they all equally struggling? You know, this would help us to plan for the future infrastructure. Sure. Well, I, I think um, natural gas, nuclear, and coal uh, performed much better than wind. I think wind at the extreme, something like 97% of it was out. And, um, you know, if we think about this, and, and I know, you know, there's, there's a lot of hope to get to 100% clean energy, natural gas uh, as a generating source is going to be around a very long time in this country. It's going to be around for decades because we as a society demand reliability, especially as we move into a more digitized um, uh, economy and electrification becomes more and more of a theme, you know, electrification of the transportation center, electrification of, of big data, and just electrification of more of what we're doing in buildings and homes. And, and we demand reliability 100% of the time. And renewables are not there yet uh, to give us that. Um, they're not there from a cost perspective, but you're, they're just physically not there yet, right? Until we get to these these large scale storage solutions that we're all working on. So uh, nuclear, right? Green and highly reliable, maybe the most reliable form of, of power in our country running at you know, 95% capacity rates. I like to say half of society likes it, half of society doesn't like it, which is like in most topics in, in the world today. Uh, but I think nuclear clearly is on the decline. It just will cost an awful lot of money to take a 50 year old facility, which many of these are, and, and um, you know, give it another 20, 30 years of life when there's a risk that the government or, or society or just a state will say you're gonna be shut down. But, it, but in this case, you know, um, natural gas, some of the natural gas was shut down because ERCOT um, triggered forced, forced outages and shut them down. There wasn't that much of it that was down because of mechanical reasons. Some of it was scheduled outages. Um, coal generally wasn't supposed to run this time of year. So when the coal that was out, some of it, the coal pile really wasn't uh, built up and they, they, they didn't you know, have the fuel that they, uh, you know, they needed. And the nuclear outage was a, you know, was a, was a, a small one. So um, I just, you know, come back to natural gas. It's quick start. Uh, it, it takes you a week to turn on a nuclear plant, it might take you days to turn on a coal plant, but natural gas is the one that can, as the, as the weather, as the wind and the sun mm -hmm. intermittent, uh, natural gas is the one that can turn on quickly. Natural gas is cheap uh, because the price of natural gas, as I said earlier, has dropped so much because of all of the abundant production uh, in this country. And natural gas is so much cleaner than, than coal. And um, you know, it's displacing coal as a form of power generation, which is a, which, which is a good thing. But I think you're gonna see um, natural gas as the transition uh, fuel for power generation as we move to that clean energy, you know, approaching 100% renewable and it's gonna be around for decades as storage solutions uh, evolve. That'd be my view of it. Thanks, Tao. So Mike, uh, any thought on, on this along this line, you know, how could these uh, infrastructure be improved giving these different sources of uh, electricity? Yeah, and I, th I think the one, I mean, I, I, I generally agree with everything Doug said, uh, you know, natural gas, if you look at it, went from about 31% of, of 
of production from early February in Texas to about 62% during the crisis. And so capacity factor uh, changed in a way that was favorable for natural gas. I think the jury's still out a little bit on the wind. I mean, so one of the questions is, is it just winterization? Was it poor choices on the way the wind was designed and built? I mean, there may be parts of the wind thing that can be addressed and fixed that aren't in a way endemic to wind. But I think clearly Texas was not ready. Their wind assets were not ready for what occurred. And so, you know, you, other smarter people than me can kind of dive into that. Um, the only other infrastructure stuff I'd really get to, uh, in addition to what Doug said, and, and this may get to a little more out there, but, you know, storage, big scale electricity storage is harder to get to near term. There are a lot of companies coming that are developing both front of the meter utility scale projects, as well as behind the meter kind of for commercial and industrial customers. Um, but you know there is there is this opportunity with software to enable the formation of microgrids, community distributed generation assets. I, I think that could come in and help with resiliency as well. But then you have other forms of storage. So if you really get you know leaning in, uh, you know hydrogen is coming at some point, and whether it's whether it's using you know renewable energy to create hydrogen as a storage fuel and then uh, and then burn the hydrogen when you need to. Um, you know, or, or new types of gas storage that are on the horizon. I, you know, there is a more holistic approach to storage that I think we need to plot a course towards. Um, and I, look, I, I, I will, the way I would frame it is one of the really different things now than in the past is people are mandating solar and wind. And so utility planning cycles are very different than when I started my career 30 years ago where you do this long-term lowest cost of energy and lots of great analysis, this is more mandate, right? We're gonna be, you know, hit a carbon reduction target by X year, they're coming. And so given that they're coming, how do you design the grid to deal with that? How do you do it at the right pace, which is part of what Doug's getting to, and make sure that you don't incur this big human cost, um, you know, to try to hit an, a, a somewhat arbitrary political objective of being, carbon neutral or, you know, lower carbon by some date in the future. Well, this is a perfect timing. I think Sally has a, a, a good question to ask both of you. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, the concerns about uh, climate change, you know, continue to grow and we're starting to see governments around the world, um, you know, take more and more aggressive action. And, you know, in particular, um, uh, the current administration, the Biden administration has proposed really a very aggressive plan for the electricity sector with uh, for a zero emission grid. Uh, with the short-term goal in 2030 of getting to 80% clean electricity and 100% clean electricity by, by 2035. And, and I, I maybe I'll sort of frame this from my perspective, you know, clean energy includes, uh, you know, anything where you can get carbon emissions near zero. So that would include like natural gas with carbon capture and storage, nuclear, you know, all, all of the above. So uh, anyway, sort of in light of that, you know, is such an aggressive plan possible? You know, can we can, can we do this? You know, can we mobilize the massive investment uh, that would be needed? And um, you know, and considering the reliability, right? We don't want just a system that's zero emission. You know, we want one that also works all the time in the zero emission. So uh, so I guess uh, you know either either one of you maybe if you want to kick off a discussion about. How do we do this quickly? Well, I, I, Doug, I'll go. I mean, I, I, I think the, um, you know, there is a real spirit of innovation and anything is possible. Um, and and I, I think these are very tough objectives to try to hit uh, in a politically divisive environment. But I will say, um, you know, Secretary Schultz is no longer with us, but he was a huge fan of putting a price on carbon and the carbon dividend. And I think the best way to get there is to try to find a reasonable way to put some kind of a cost on carbon and let industry and individuals innovate to figure out how to get there. And, and, and the, I think doing it by mandate um, and the patchwork system state by state is very hard. We can debate what the price of carbon would be and how fast it should grow and all those kind of things. But I think that is a, a, a big enabling factor to try to get there from a policy perspective. Um, you know, otherwise, I think I worry you're going to have mandate-driven 
uh, objective, which are laudable, uh, but may make it very hard to avoid what we saw in Texas and California. So. Yeah, and I would say, look, you have to put side by side. I know the passion is there, there on decarbonization and 100% clean, and that's where the, the, the dominant passion is. But I, I like to say we, we, we need to solve for, for four things side by side. Okay, and we'll, we'll put decarbonization, you know, right there as a, as a key one, but cost, right? Whether it's cost that our economy needs to stay competitive on a global basis, whether it's one state where another state has to stay competitive, whether it's just that our, we have to make sure our economy grows so that there's jobs, so that you can't throw out cost as a, as a goal here, that it has to be reasonable. Number three, you all know what that is, is reliability, right? And we've talked about it and look at this, we've had three bad days and it was, you know, it was a tragedy in, in Texas and we can't have that. So that, that, that one, some might argue, might go to the top of the list here because what would society be if, we, if it, this, this happened every month? Because it's, it's, you know, people die from, from freezing to death and the, and the like and think of, you know, hospitals with, with no electricity. So you gotta put reliability um, right there. And the fourth, this is the most capital intensive industry in America. So it takes capital. Capital needs a return. You might not like to talk about that, but without an investment return, no one's gonna put the money up. And so you have to have economic models that will draw in capital so that these, these uh, asset solutions take hold. You can't just say for the government to do it. I don't think the government is gonna nationalize the power industry. The best the government can do is to provide short-term incentives, generally tax incentives, loan guarantees to push things along, but you need an investor at the end of the day will, willing to take the risk and put up capital to have the potential to earn a profit. So I, I put forth for all of you that I, you know, we feel the passion on decarbonization, but you got to put side by side cost, reliability, and investment return, whether you like it or not. You, you can't just solve for one of these. You got to solve for, for all four of these. And I think there's a lot of ingenuity. Maybe later, um, Mike and I will talk about this world of, of SPACs and pipes, uh, because we have this thing that, that uh, guys like Dan Riker used to like to talk about the valley of death. Where's the money going to come from? Uh, for these carbon capture projects and things like that. And we're starting to see signs that the equity market is saying, yes, um, we're going to help on the profitability side to get there. But that's kind of the perspective that I, that I put it in. And, and Sally, you said, you know, natural gas with, 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 with carbon capture. I, I, I think we're going to need natural gas to be a component. I'm not so sure that 100% target is necessarily the, uh, the, the right target. Don't forget that the United States is less than 15% of the world's, you know, carbon emissions come from the, the uh, United States and we've been shrinking. But you know, for us to get to, uh, to zero, um, we still have to deal with the rest of the world doing this. And that might be quite a burden on our society from cost and, and you know, reliability uh, perspectives. And if we had this quick start cheap natural gas in there as the reliability piece to be there when it's not windy and it's not, not sunny, and if we can maybe attach some capture to that, um, you know, uh, maybe there's something in there. But those are the pieces. And I think we're, we're, if we had this conversation with Mike and I 10 years ago, we would have been far less optimistic uh, than, than we are now. I think we're, we're, we're very optimistic, but still a lot of work to do. Great, thank you. Okay, E, back over to you. Yeah, um, now coming to the uh, resilience again, um, we know solar and wind, right? This is uh, really now building up, growing like crazy, really fast as the uh, renewable sources for electricity. Coming back to the resilience, this is certainly attached to, to, to my heart of my own research. In the past 15 years, I've been thinking about what's the best energy storage solution. Natural gas as a, a, a backup is great for seasonal, particularly talking about seasonal energy storage. Um, so is it natural gas? Is it a new type of batteries or is it you know, for energy storage or some other form, thermal storage or, or pump hydro, which you consider? Uh, what's uh, your thought on, on, on this? Um, uh, yeah. Mike, particularly for you, certainly Doc, if you want to chime in, please, please do, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a little bit of an all of the above on storage uh, attitude that I have. I, I will say one, one thing is, um, one thing is clear, and that is that the, even, even the existing lithium ion battery technology has gotten to a price point um, where it can be very competitive for solving certain kind of problems. So if you need, a, if you need to catch a peak in about a four hour window, um, there are now some very attractive uh, economic options to do that, you know, batteries made by Tesla and others. Um, and in particular, if you can layer software in on that. And so we're, uh, we have, I'm on the board of a company called STEM that uh, we're actually merging with here in the next couple of weeks. But what they do is they, they layer an, an artificial intelligence machine learning software on top of batteries that are located, distributed batteries all around the system. And during the blackouts last summer in California, and again, the California market has some unique uh, properties in the way that you can bid into these markets. But they basically, back in August, they were able to create a number of virtual power plants on the fly, the software was, and bid about 50 megawatts of support into the grid in Southern California to help uh, alleviate, you know, kind of the rolling blackout threat uh, during all the fires. And so I do think that, you know, we are seeing innovation on how to, how to better utilize software to get more out of what we already have. And then we have some of these emerging uh, storage technologies um, that I think can make a difference, but it's gonna take time. I mean, it's just, it's going to take time. And there are, uh, you, you know more, you should be talking more about this than me, but you know, outside of, kind of lithium ion and, and, the, and, and, and the technologies we have now, there are more interesting technologies coming down that can deal with you know, seasonal uh, big storage shifts, uh, big big kind of peak shifts in seasonality. I, I just add very quickly, um, the challenge has gotten greater because of where we're headed with the demand for electricity. So electricity demand growth has been pretty much flat the last several decades because energy efficiency has largely offset growth in GDP related electricity growth. And by the way, that has been the number one source of decarbonization. We don't talk about it enough. It's great advances in energy efficiency. But now we're going to electrify the transportation sector. And that is going to be an enormous jump in the demand for electricity. Big data, high-speed computing. The statistic that I like to talk about is, is I've read that now 1% of global electricity demand is for cryptocurrency mining. And so there's a very intensive energy sector that has just cropped up. And we're talking about the need for power plants being built in a lot of places to, to, to satisfy the, uh, uh, the miners. But all what's coming on, on AI, um, even when we, we, we talk about how uh, you know, computing is solving for viruses and vaccines, this is not one person with a test tube in a lab. This is high-speed computing. So big data, a voracious demand for, for electricity. And then buildings and, and homes, you know, not, not being heated by fuel oil and natural gas, that's going to, to electricity. So we're gonna have to deal with this increased demand uh, at the same time that we wanna decarbonize, which is making the, the challenge greater. So it's gonna take uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. It's gonna take technological uh, ingenuity. Yes, it's gonna have to take some policy shifts. And back to what I said, it's gonna have to be consumers and society uh, are going to have to say we're willing to pay for this, the decarbonization. Maybe this is back to George Schultz and his, his view of carbon tax. We've got to put a price on this. And uh, I think it's, there's encouraging signs that consumers are willing to pay for this, but there's no free lunch. Yeah, what D Doug made a great point on the, on the uh, crypto uh, uh, miners. And that is, I mean, if you, if you think about demand side management, they're like one of the greatest opportunities I think out there because they're doing nothing but looking at data and optimizing, you know, for a profit function. And if you could give them a price signal, they will they will stop mining and 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 cut that load very very quickly, right? That's an easy use case on demand side management to help help balance the system. Um, and I think it, as as software and technology helps us deploy more into customers like that and, and get those easy wins, um, you know, that helps make the system more resilient too. Well, speaking of big data, I, I think Sally wants to have a discussion with you. I also want, want to chime in in a minute. Sally, back to you. Yeah, thank you. thanks very much. So uh, 
I think if you look at the electricity system of the past, we had large central generating st stations, we had transmission, we had fairly simple distribution systems, and we were and we had consumers at the you know along the wires and so forth. But now it's going to be much more complex. We're going to have you know within the distribution center, we're going to have generation, you know, PV. We're going to have storage. Uh, maybe other kinds of generation, maybe you know, fuel cells and, and so forth. Um, and not only is the, the distribution system more complicated, but now we are also going to be relying on electricity for our cars, right? Like imagine having a power outage, and if you're unlucky and you aren't charged up, you know, now you can't even go to the store to get some food, right? Um, so, uh, so that's not good. And, and as we saw in Texas, you know, if you're relying on electricity for heating, you know, if, if the electricity goes out, that's dire, right? You know, in the past, we had a lot of people who had uh, other forms of heating, they had natural gas, maybe a lot of wood burning uh, for, for heating. Um, and, and even industry is starting to think about how it can electrify. So it's really, really important. And, and we always think of energy assets as things like, um, you know, generating stations and, and so forth. But, you know, what do you see as the role for big data, artificial intelligence, automation, you know, sort of really thinking about the grid much more like, you know, like the autopilot of a, of a plane, for example, that is taking in all this data. And, um, you know, do you see that this can play a big role in helping with reliability and resiliency? And, you know, do you see this as sort of a new frontier for or a new major class of investments that can be made to support the electrical grid? Want me to go go first? Sure. Yeah. Like, Why don't you? Uh, this is, yeah, whatever. No. For me, this is this is year thirty eight involved with electricity. I started in nineteen eighty three, and it was viewed as like had the most boring job ever. I like to laugh. My product electricity, I still have never seen it. You know, but I but I I stuck with it, and all of a sudden, right? It's all everybody's talking about, and we have these these challenges. Um, but I think you're you're spot on, Sally. You know how electricity is going to be produced how electricity is going to be used and how we're going to prioritize the environmental impact have all dramatically changed. You know, most of my career, we didn't, I think, I think Mike said it, we did the cost analysis and if coal was the cheapest, coal is, coal is what we, we, we build. And so very, very changed, uh, you know, uh, dynamic. And so I get to, you know, just, let's just take the software management side. There's going to be a lot of big businesses in how our, our home is managed and how our you know, buildings, if we ever get away from the Zoom calls and go back to offices of, of how that is all going to be managed, optimized, because this is not as simple as you just adjusting uh, your thermostat as we integrate the solar panel, maybe the backup generator, certainly the battery, certainly uh, the electric vehicle to optimize this for cost, reliability, and lowest use of, uh, of carbon. And I think it is more and more going to be moving to a, a more distributed generation model, less so the, um, you know, the, the central station power plant will still be there, but less so. I think the wild cars, uh, certainly in terms of an area that I know you focus on, Sally, is carbon capture. We've been early and focused on that one. I think we need more focus there because I think that can, change things a lot because those two maybe can combine reliability um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and decarbonization as being, um, you know, a very big, a very big uh, a part of this. Um, but, you know, the capital is flowing and maybe I'll let Mike, if he, if he wants to, I am so excited about what's going on in the equity market, that the equity market, the public equity market has an appetite for businesses to solve these problems. Before it was stuck in the venture capital community, that maybe would, there would be ten million dollars and twenty-five million dollars, which is not going to solve a hundreds of billions of dollars of problems. And this is really just in the last year that the equity market has had an appetite for some of the types of businesses that you're talking about that that are going to really um, reconstruct a, a power industry in a very very different way. So I think we're we're cautiously optimistic. That the investor desire is starting to align with the uh, societal desire. I don't know, Mike, if you want to talk. Yeah, about I, that. I would. I agree with that completely. I mean, if you go back in history in in Silicon Valley, you know, two thousand four, five, six, there was a lot of interest in clean energy and where we're going. 
global financial crisis hit and a lot of the venture firms stopped. I mean, they just, it was a hard stop and, and uh, not much funding going on. And now what you're seeing is you just have massive capital flows into environmental, social and governance funds. And a lot of that gets directed towards clean energy and the energy transition. And so, you know, whether that gets expressed in late stage investments or SPACs or, you know, traditional IPOs, um, I, I will tell you that, that Doug's been raising capital around energy his whole career. I've been doing it my whole career. I've really never seen traditional hydrocarbons so hated and anything new in energy transition so loved. And so that is, you know, the pendulum, you know, you can debate whether it's gone too far one way or the other, but the equity markets are definitely willing to fund more of this. The other thing is the debt markets. So if you look at, again, Sonova takes lots of these long-term contracts with residential consumers uh, who have you know, financed the panels on their house for 25 years, and they, they gather those up and the debt markets are willing to, uh, you know, the most recent financing was sub 3% cost of debt. And, you can, and they'll give you a lot of advance against um, that pool of assets. And so it's not only the equity markets, the debt markets are, are very willing to fund um, you know, things like wind and solar, and that's certainly helped. So it, it, again, that goes back to the point Doug was making, that, that those are sources of optimism, and that's a real difference from the past, um, but it's, it's still a very heavy lift to, uh, uh, you know, to get to some of these goals. Okay, thank you. Back to you. Yeah, this discussion is great. So uh, both of you touch upon, you know, how do you finance the, uh, the clean energy project? That, that's very exciting. So we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. Um, but before we take the audience questions, let me brainstorm with you a little bit on the blue sky ideas. Uh, just throwing right there for, for discussion uh, purpose. And uh, if you look at Texas grid, right, it's basically an isolated grid right there. Um, so would it make sense to think about a national interconnected super grid. Um, we know nowadays there's a 1.2 million watt of DC transmission line technology available, you know, can deliver 12 gigawatt of power over a long distance, basically 2000 miles, which is the same distance from the US West Coast to the East Coast. You know, that's as one, one, one thought, right? For, just for brainstorming. The second thought is, would it make sense to also consider a national electricity reserve, you know, having big, big energy storage right there, uh, a, a number of them, maybe not just one, and uh, to, you know, reserve to, to balance the grid to respond to the extreme weather. Certainly this will couple together with uh, many, many, you know, uh, distributed small, small scale energy storage. So what, would this uh, kind of blue sky idea make sense to, to go down to the path to, to discuss a little bit more? Who's first? Am I, am I first here on the tough, the, the toughest question of the, uh, of the day? So yes, we have a highly inefficient grid system in this country that was built on a regional basis. And I, I, I love to talk about history because it really wasn't that long ago that we electrified the nation, you know, a hundred years or so ago, and it, it really was Thomas Edison and and kind of his 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 number two Samuel Insel were the the lead, and and uh, I think the book about Samuel Insel, if you're really excited about the history of power, I think it's called The Merchant of Power. It's just a short read. You should you should read it to understand where where we are. But you know, we had um, he really first electrified the city of Chicago. There was a utility, Commonwealth Edison, and it really was a, a big conglomerate. And uh, that was it. And the stock market crash hit in 1929. And uh, that was viewed as a safe investment, but it wasn't. And a lot of people lost a, lost a lot of money. And when we elect, started electrifying the, the country, Congress, in its ultimate wisdom, came in and something, the 1935 Act, the Public Utility Holding Company Act, and said, we got to do this on a regional basis. It's too risky to have one big conglomerate controlling the transmission grid. Every state, every region should control its own destiny. So that's how we got to where, where we are. Because you'd say, how the heck is Texas an electrical island? That's a that's a dumb idea. But that's that that's the history. I, I like to say, you know, 
the government stuck their finger in that one and look at look at what we look at what we um, what we got. Um, but talk about an expensive project to do a, 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 a national grid. If it were me, I would be moving in the other direction, more towards distributed generation and more what Mike had described in, in terms of the uh, uh, battery technologies on a distributed basis. I think Sally maybe mentioned pump storage. I love pump storage. Uh, that is a battery that's been around a long time. When we started building nuclear in this country, we were very scared. What if, it, what if nuclear doesn't work? We can't have Boston without electricity for two years. We need something large and quick start if it goes out. So we have a half dozen big ones in this country. This is water at elevation that can be dropped instantaneously to turn a turbine and create electricity. And then at night, when we don't need electricity as, as much and it's cheaper, we pump it back up and do it again. So I could see a model where we had a bunch of pump storage. We tried to develop one for almost 10 years in California and permitting is local. Um, and it really is. And building a transmission line is about the hardest thing one can imagine from a permitting mm -hmm. point of view. I like to say in a power plant, we can see our neighbors of who has to get comfortable. Oh my goodness, a transmission line going across the whole country. Anybody in their backyard can raise their hand and get you in the courts and, and hold it up. So I don't think it's all that likely. I also, not to get into the controversial issue of forest fires, you know, and we have in California, the utilities are so nervous about getting sued for any fire. If there's even a hint of it, they're gonna shut the system down and there goes reliability you know, out the window. Maybe we need some, some tort reform, but the more transmission lines you build through forests, newsflash, there is lightning and it does get windy and transmission lines go down and that can spark fires. And do we really want more of that? So yep. I lean a little against all that and very controversial topic. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I would just make one other uh, uh, point that <clears throat> alongside Doug there, which is there's a real locational advantage to distributed storage and distributed generation. And so you could you could put relatively small amounts of, of capital. You, know, you, you could drop a five megawatt, 20 megawatt hour battery pack, uh, you know, in a congested urban area. And that is far easier to cite. It can give you, you know, nearly all the benefits of a complete redo of a substation or a transmission line. And so when you take all the not in my backyard stuff and, and the permitting difficulties, uh, there's just a practical, you can get a lot of the resiliency, reliability benefit out of, you know, lots of little solutions scattered around the system than one sort of mega um, answer. Um, you know, and the only thing I'd, I'd say, if you really go blue sky, and there are really new forms of hyper-efficient storage, you could turn that on its head. Um, you know, and and so even when 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 your when your department comes up with the uh, you know the blockbuster of all batteries, that may change that. So. Yeah, you know, I like to mention that Dan Michael keep uh, uh, telling me about this. I think I really like it. We have a lot of pump hydro uh, ca capacity right here in the U.S. We have not utilized yet. Yeah, um, well. Certainly, battery innovation continue going. Sally, back to you. Okay, well, I think we're going to uh, actually move to the questions from, uh, from the audience now. So thank you very much for your questions and, uh, and do, uh, do keep co those coming. Um, so the first question is um, actually builds right along with what Mike was just saying. Uh, and it sort of poses a question that since there are no markets for resiliency, how do you establish revenue streams to increase resiliency as opposed to, for example, just capacity payments, you know, because there are other very valuable services that you need for resiliency. So, how, you know, what would be a specific plan for, you know, getting markets that would do that and how might those work? And, and this is for both uh, Mike and Doug. Yeah, go, go ahead, Doug. You, uh, you started it. You brought, you brought, yeah, I brought it up. Right. You brought it up. It's a tough one. Well, I, I, it, it is a tough one. And I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the easy way, you split it into kind of three categories, right? So there's sort of uh, customer resiliency. So at the customer level, you've got utility. You know, what does the utility need to do to be resilient? And then usually the grid operator, right? So you have kind of three different constituencies and they can all, monetize it in different ways. So the customer might be willing to pay for backup power, right, locally at their facility and, and you know, let me, let me deal with rate design and catch a demand peak and lower my bill, right? And the utility may be willing to pay, in the case of storage, to drop storage somewhere because they don't have to invest in 
uh, you know, new T and D assets or or solve some other congestion problem. They might have an RFP uh, where they can offer incentives to do that. Um, and then the ISO, you know, I think it's it's getting markets like frequency regulation, um, you know, spinning reserves, kind of voltage support market. I mean, it gets pretty esoteric pretty quickly on how you do that. But um, you know, the short answer is I I actually don't. I have a sense of what all the services are. I think it's very tricky to figure out how to balance and do the market design well. Um, and but but you you know the more of those kinds of value propositions you can expose and 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 allow the market to bid on, the better off I think you are. So it's more than just energy and capacity. Although just capacity capacity markets could help a lot. I mean just that that one change. And I'll just say I think all of that a little bit easier to do in a regulated market than a deregulated market. We, we can't put the genie back in the bottle here and, and re-regulate, I don't believe, those parts of the country, half of the country that was, was deregulated. And sometimes, you know, out of those regulated markets, you know, in the South and Southern Company and places, places like that, they can kind of put in the model and the example of how this could work for then the deregulated market to say, okay, we, we see it and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll move in that, that direction. Um, unfortunately, most of our residential customers don't have the sophistication to figure all of this out kind of on their, you know, on their own. I'd say the great strides with commercial and industrial customers and in deregulated markets have gotten very smart of um, how to price these things. And, and they, I think they value reliability now reasonably well. They, they didn't used to. Um, but the residential side seems to work a little bit better in a regulated market to figure out some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No, it seems like a tough question. And, and, you know, especially when you, you know, you have your four things, decarbonization, cost, reliability, and capital, capital intensity. If cost isn't important, yes, we can imagine layering on all these services, but at, at what point, you know, do you, you know, how do you, how do you balance all of these factors? And, and ultimately, like sort of who's in charge of ensuring that the customers have, you know, reasonably low cost electricity when you have, you know, so many competing markets. So, so I think that's a really good problem if there are uh, students out there who are interested in these, uh, that, that would be very helpful. Okay, E, back to you. Yeah, uh, Mike and Dal, I want to uh, get one of the audience questions to you. This is about hydrogen. Uh, this person is asking, should North America consider more investment in renewably sourced hydrogen infrastructure, especially the underground pipelines uh, and as grid scale energy storage using hydrogen? Um, this is uh, as an alternative to a greater reliance and investment in the electricity grid, particularly in Texas. I guess it's not limited by the, in Texas, it could be everywhere. So. The general thinking about hydrogen. Um, yeah, well, let me let me let me have one easy example, and that's at, at, you know. So Kinder Morgan's the largest operator of natural gas pipelines. You know, one of the things we're looking at is mixing sort of five to ten percent hydrogen in. If you get beyond that, you have a very destructive effect on the pipeline. So you, you start hitting the pipeline integrity. Um, you know, there can be innovation. There can be material science innovation around that that could help, um, and and ways to maybe get that percentage higher. You know that's blending in. So if you had, you know, pick an example, you had a lot of sun in West Texas, and you were creating, uh, you know, you were using solar power to create hydrogen out of out of water, right? You're just basically making uh, H2, and then mixing that into a gas stream. That's a pretty easy way to transport it today. Now that's blending it in. It's not, you know, sort of a pure answer, um, but you're also able to get it to a lot of industrial markets on the Gulf Coast that could that could use it pretty quickly. I think. Um, you know, getting getting the national infrastructure to really move hydrogen around at scale, um, you know, would be like Eisenhower project building a highway. So, I mean, it would it, there would be you know, uh, it'd have to be a big national priority and initiative to get there. Um, and it's it's coming. I mean, it's going to be there in the long run. I'm a pretty firm believer that we're going to be able to use hydrogen for a lot of things. It just it's very very early days. As an investor, it's it's hard to find things that are um, yeah, you know, late stage enough on the hydrogen side uh, uh, to have a, a big scale difference right now, other than the traditional industrial uses of hydrogen, of which there are, there are many. Yeah, I agree. And even, you know, we're all excited. There's an infrastructure bill 
coming. And I think the scale of what Mike talked about, I don't see this one right at the top at, on the list at all um, to build. And it would be it'd probably be bigger than the entire infrastructure bill itself if we were to, to go there. So certainly a lot of a lot of promise, a lot of benefits, but um, the um, infrastructure challenge may be greater than that that national grid blue sky idea that you put forth. He. Yeah. So it's just, um, well, two of you are uh, our advisory council member, just report back to you. Uh, hydrogen questions like this is a, a perfect one for university, for academia to study. And, um, and Prequel Institute, we are planning uh, an initiative on hydrogen at this moment. Actually, today is our hydrogen workshop engaging industry quite a bit. So. Uh, down the road, I will let you know what we find out and from the you know, low cost generation of hydrogen transportation storage to utilization for uh, particularly decarbonizing the heavy duty industry. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because, you know, in Mike and I world, we, we, you know, we hope to look out, you know, 10 years, but we have investors and we have returns and there's many in our, in our world that look no more than 12 months out, you know, for an investment return. And, um, you know, funding in the Department of Energy to go through these things necessarily hasn't necessarily been there. So it's the universities are the ones that can take on the 25 to 40 year projects. And we need you and we need to support you to be there to think through the practicalities of all of all of these things. But um, you can't always just rely on uh, the capital markets and investors to come into things um, when they're, you know, so, so, so early stage. So we're there to support your efforts. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's in the right place at Stanford to dig into that. Yeah, this is a good synergy right here. Yes. Uh, Sally, back to you. Okay, all right, thanks. So, uh, so this is another question um, from the audience and you've already sort of partially addressed this, but uh, going back to Texas, you know, being an independent grid, I mean, if you look across the country, there's Texas, ERCOT, and then there's WEC, and then, you know, in the Eastern United States, there's, you know, a bunch of, of different uh, uh, system operators, but, but Texas really stands out as being, you know, decoupled. Um, so, you know, I guess number one is sort of how much do you think it would have helped um, had it been able to be connected? And, and then just sort of by analogy, perhaps looking at California, we get about 25% of our electricity is actually imported and um, you know, that's actually very helpful. And, and looking to the future in California, you know, unless deep water, you know, offshore floating wind turbines, you know, get to be cost effective, uh, it's going to be really hard to get to a completely decarbonized grid because we don't really have a very good onshore wind resource. So if we want wind, we're going to really need to connect to Wyoming or, you know, someplace that's got a world-class wind resource. So, um, you know, I guess maybe, you know, so what do you know about sort of why Texas chose to do what it was doing and, and you know, and should it consider, you know, a broader set of connections for, um, for all kinds of benefits, both being able to sell more electricity to the rest of the country, but also to help in times of shortage. And I, either one of you. I, I'm going to Doug, Doug's the history buff. And so I think he may know more of the history. I mean, it's always been that way is the short answer. But Doug, I don't know if you want to opine on well, that historical side of it so you brought up i think you said uh, wyoming there that's really what they love to do in idaho wyoming um montana is to sell their cheap electricity to california i, I think not um and so uh that's a child there's a lot of cheap hydropower in the pacific northwest and 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 just as an aside you know that snowpack isn't always there and uh you know just when california wants it is maybe when it's not there and they're going to keep it for themselves. So there's a lot of territorial uh, issues uh, on that. And California, let's just say, doesn't have a lot of great fans and its neighbors um, to, to accommodate that. California doesn't like to talk about it. I think they're almost done with coal, but they were a big buyer of coal fire generation for decades from Utah and uh, Arizona and Nevada. I still think it's a little bit, uh, a little bit there, so those those Teslas in Los Angeles. If you're using LA Department of Water and Power, I'm sorry, you're still burning some some coal fired generation uh, in there. But obviously, from a, a system optimization, you would want these uh, power grids to be more 
regional and you'd want to have more diversity of, of, of fuel. So it's not a great thing that you have the Pacific Northwest hydro, 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 California renewables, renewables. The South has got a lot of, um, uh, you know, nuclear. There's other places that were, you know, very hot, heavily concentrated in, in coal. And really, if we went to my four things and that reliability and cost, you know, with those two, you would have a much more all of the above type strategy. And you can't do that just state by state. Um, siting, um, transmission lines are probably the hardest thing in the power world to, to get built. Mike, I don't know if it's harder than a pipeline. Sometimes you can't see the pipeline. Yeah, it usually is, but. <laughs> Pipelines haven't been doing so well on permitting these days, uh, but transmission lines are, are, are right there. So I like to say there's no just in our, in our world of heavy infrastructures, just do this or just do that. So on paper, yeah, we would have more system efficiencies, better reliability and lower cost if we had more interconnection. But I like to say good luck on getting a lot of that accomplished. Yeah, I, I, I'd say the same thing. Look, inter, more interconnection is good generically, uh, it, you know, with respect to winter storm Gary and, and what happened in February in Texas, it was very cold in Louisiana and some of the neighboring states too. So it's not clear, uh, it would have had some incremental benefit. It's not clear how big that is. And, um, you know, Texas is a huge power economy on its own. And so I, I think, look, that more interconnection is great. I don't know at what scale, uh, you know, the real diminishing returns exist. Um, but uh, Doug made the right practical point, which is it's just very hard. If it's, you know, again, if there are, if there are cheaper fixes to get more integration than, yeah. than massive new uh, transmission lines, you know, th those yeah. are easy wins. And you're right. It's not when we're, there's a there's a weather crisis that weather doesn't look at the state lines. Right. And that's the last point in time that places like Oklahoma and Louisiana are going to want to part with their very precious power to help out their very large neighbors. So um, practical issues. Okay, thanks. E, back to you. Yeah, this uh, uh, one person asking in the audience about Norway. Uh, Norway's uh, electricity, I just look it up, is 98% uh, renewable. Um, anything we can learn from Norway? Of course, if I look at the, uh, the composition of the renewable electricity, mostly is uh, hydropower. <laughs> So I, I, well, whether this is something we can learn in, in the United States right here, what, what's it? What's your thought? Yeah. At least I've been to Norway, Mike. I don't know if you've been to been been to Norway. I do say they have a, an incredible amount of wealth in Norway from oil. You can't forget that. Yeah. In terms, of a lot of their wealth came from, which was what was able to fund a push to renewables. But there's a difference between baseload renewables and highly intermittent renewables. We're, I, I think the nation, nation's in, in my firm, largest owner of geothermal. And so geothermal is wonderful steam out of the earth. It runs all the time. And you can't just uh, talk about geothermal the same way that you're gonna talk about wind and, uh, and solar. So the pecking order of reliable renewables starts with geothermal, then goes to, to, to hydro. Um, and then you probably get to solar because solar for the most part is peak coincident. It's sunny when demand is the highest. And then you kind of get to, you know, get to wind and offshore wind being better than onshore wind. And they were able to do a fair amount of, of offshore wind, which has been a very, very difficult thing to permit in the United States. And there's more talk that we're going to be trying to do, uh, do more of that. But yeah, they had, uh, they had the uh, capital availability. They have one of the largest, um, uh, sovereign wealth funds in, in the world because of their 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 oil uh, wealth. So they had the the ability to divert public monies to do these things. Um, uh, they have the offshore wind, they have the hydro, so that gave them a big advantage. So a lot of this is where are you located and what are the tools that you have to, to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to deal with. And California does not bear a lot of resemblance uh, to, to Norway just in terms of the physical nature of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sally, back to you. Okay, all right, uh, another question from the audience. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that the nuclear plant was, you know, shutting down every six months or so. Uh, what we used to have 100, now what, maybe we're down at 96 or something like that, and, you know, more, more to go. And, and part of the trouble for nuclear power plants is they're having a, a difficult time competing, um, you know, in the markets. And, 
in part because of these zero marginal cost renewable generation resources, also low cost gas. But anyway, with that background, so here it's actually quite a specific question. <clears throat> if there were a $40 per ton tax, for example, on all fossil based generation, um, would that be enough to sort of tilt the tides and so that at least the nuclear would be economically viable? Uh, and competitive compared to fossil fuel generation in the, in the U.S. Um, or is there some other, you know, number, you know, sixty dollars a ton or whatever? Would yeah, would it change the game for nuclear if there was a carbon tax for power generation? I'm, I'm, you want me to talk about nuclear a little bit? My, Mike and I are not that quick to come up with the calculation on if it's forty-two and a half or, or what the numbers. Well, let's just talk about nuclear uh, for a second. So we'll start with the trend of shutting down and Sally, you were, you were spot on um, low, you know, low marginal cost renewables, but this, this natural gas thing that has dropped in price by, by 90%. So the, the uh, fuel on the margin that drives electricity prices is natural gas in most regions of the, of the country. And so nuclear makes electricity. So it's not getting that much of a margin for its product to increase its life for another 10, 20, 30 years, it's going to have to invest several billion dollars, right? Old rusty pipes and all that kind of stuff to, to put the money in there. Is it a good investment? Is it a good return on capital to put that money in a nuclear plant when your product electricity right now is not earning a very high margin? And then there's this other problem of society doesn't, half of society doesn't like you. Okay, so you're gonna have to put a very big discount rate and risk factor. I'm gonna spend the billion dollars. Am I gonna be allowed to operate for the next 20 years to get a return on that capital when we have you know elections for governors every four years and we have new york they want to shut down indian point and california shutting down uh, their plants now we're finally starting to hear the word maybe a little bit out of the new administration oh this nuclear may be um that um it's green maybe there's no greenhouse gases maybe it's it's uh, it's reliable um, and maybe in the United States, from a safety point of view, the safety record has been uh, pretty much perfection uh, in, in, in the United States. And I know there's Chernobyl and I know there's, there's Fukushima. But then you take the other side and say, well, why don't you build a new nuclear plant? The problem is, is if you remember the last go round of building nuclear plants in this country, um, it, it took decades. So we have an NRC today, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that has not permitted a new nuclear plant. And that would be a very daunting task to go in with a new design that has never been approved. It's going to take years and years and years and iterations and iterations. So I really don't know any financial investors that would say, yeah, what I want to do is build a nuclear plant that's going to take me 10 years to get permitted, that the design is going to be changed 20 times, and that the society may, who knows, in 10 years decide that I need to be shut down. I think that's sad. I happen to be you know, a, a proponent of nuclear, of solving my, my, my four that I, I, I came up with there. Um, but it's out of favor in this country. And I think it's gonna have to be really a big political mindset shift. And I know people like Bill Gates are behind it and there's module, modular nuclear that are uh, potentially solutions. But I hope we can have a sea change. I think it may be too late to save our existing nuclear plants just because of their age, but it would be sure nice if there's a sea change. And I almost put it back to Stanford as you spend time on carbon capture and battery storage, I'd be, I hope there's time spent on the next generation of nuclear as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Doug. Uh, this uh, discussion has been very exciting, both of you, Mike and Doug. Um, I want to report back to both of you, um, you know, the planning for the next generation of energy system is so important. And uh, in pre-call right here, we uh, will be announcing soon in about a week time of our first set of pre-call pioneering project using big data, AI uh, for energy and, and, and climate, and also integrating the uh, environmental justice into the uh, consideration. You know, taking technology piece, the policy piece, economic piece right there, we'll be announcing two uh, winning project, Sally is involved uh, in, in one of them. It will be very exciting to get your feedback, your insight on, on those projects. So with that, let me uh, conclude today's event. Um, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us uh, around the world. And I, we hope uh, you found today's Global Energy Dialogue very 
informative and relevant during uh, these unprecedented times. Uh, we will conclude now our broadcast of today's program on behalf of the entire Stanford Preco Institute for Energy. We would like to thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Thank you.